God's grace will work through you. And it's the same thing. The next point, verse 2, I wrote on your outline that God's grace keeps the church alive. And we already read that and talked about that. It says there, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Then verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I wrote on your outline that enduring hardness is what brings life to the gospel. You're there in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look over in chapter 4. So, um, you see in verse 2, he's told to preach the word. Then in verse 3, you see the hardness or the tribulations because it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. So here you've got people who stray away from the sound doctrine. They believe false doctrine. Uh, they won't even endure sound doctrine. And so uh, they're not faithful men. Timothy is enduring hardness, enduring having to battle with this false doctrine of the tendency of people just to follow the lust of their flesh and not to be strengthened uh, in the inner man by the sound doctrine. And he says there in verse 5 now, 2 Timothy 4, 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Notice the last part there, make full proof of thy ministry. And that's related to those sufferings there. Verse 7, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Paul endured hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, what you're doing, if you were strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, you lay before the doctrine so that whenever false doctrine is around, you're able to snuff it out. You don't tolerate it in the church. And you continue in it. Then... And then when those persecutions come, you still stand fast in that doctrine. Then what Paul says there in 2 Timothy 4, 5, is he's making full proof of thy ministry. So when you've got people who preach, like say for today, for example, uh, many churches will talk about the gospel. They really won't define it. But even if, they, if you do pin them down, usually what you'll hear, even among the ones that teach eternal security, what they'll usually say is, is you need to repent, which they're saying, which they define as turning from your sins. So you have to turn from your sins and make Jesus the Lord of your life, and then you have eternal life. Um, the resurrection, the blood is all taken out of that. Even if that's there, they're still telling you to turn from your sins, but Romans 5, 8 says, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say after we turn from our sins, Christ died for us. Uh, so that's false doctrine that you'll hear out there among most churches. But yet, if you stand fast in the sound doctrine, and you're allowing the love of Christ to work through you, the power of God, you have that sound mind, then what you're doing then is you're making full proof of your ministry. So when people hear... When you teach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for your sins, and they see the change in your life as a result, you've made the full proof of your ministry as opposed to the other ministry that teaches a false gospel, and all they're doing is making a fair show in the flesh, and you don't really see the changed life. Um, so, I wrote on your outline that enduring hardness brings life to the gospel, and we can also go over 1 Corinthians 9. We read this in the last message. Uh, but with a different emphasis. 1 Corinthians 9. Look in verse 24. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So there's your, uh, where we read over there in 2 Timothy 2 about enduring hardness as a good soldier. Here's he's, temperate in all things. Uh, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And now notice the last part, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So if he's not following the sound doctrine, people will say, well, Paul, why should I listen to you? You're not any different than anybody else out there. But when he preaches that sound doctrine, 
preaches the gospel and they can see he's changed life. Before he was a persecutor, a blasphemer, and injurious. And now he's given up all that he had in the flesh and he's considered himself to be dead and alive unto Christ and allowed the doctrine to work through him. Now people can see the change in his life so that when he proclaims the gospel, they don't just cast it away. They say, there must be something to this, Paul. It's not like the message I heard at that other church about turning from my sins. I've tried that. I can't do it. And I noticed they can't do it either because they're, they're following, uh, they're, they're still in sin too. But Paul, I noticed you're different. You're a changed life through Christ. So I'm not going to cast you away. I'm going to believe the gospel that you preach. So uh, enduring hardness is what brings life to the gospel. Um, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And that has to do with spiritual hearing. And a lot of times people won't spiritually hear or listen to the message unless they see that the message has changed the life of the messenger. Um, so that's why he says there in 2 Timothy 2, 3, to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Then in verse 4 he says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And um, I put on your outline that the affairs of this life include moral causes. Because usually people think the affairs of this life, they're thinking of, of um, going after material possessions and wealth and power. And that includes that, that, that's true, but what's more important or what people a lot of times don't see is that what people will do is they'll try to serve God out of the energies of their flesh and so then they will concern themselves with the affairs of this life, what we would call moral causes. And there's always some moral cause that Christianity as a whole is fighting right now. It's homosexuality. Before that, uh, you go back 30 years, abortion was a big thing. Um, you know, abortion is still as bad now as it was 30 years ago. People aren't really talking about it so much. You know, you go back before then, well, prayer in schools. Or, or um, you know, go back before then, there was some other cause. Um, prohibition in 1920, alcohol. Um, and those are really the affairs of this life because those things are going to take care of themselves when we have the glorified flesh, we're not going to participate in the vile things of this life because we have the glorified flesh. And uh, even right now, we can still uh, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling and allow the, the doctrine to work through us so that uh, we naturally won't do those things. So we won't be alcoholics or we won't have the abortions or we won't... Um, had the homosexuality just because we have allowed Christ to live through us. So those are just natural results. And so Paul is telling Timothy, you know, don't get caught up in that popular Christianity cause that we're fighting and then we seem like we're a good soldier of Christ. He says that no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. What we need to recognize is God hasn't saved us so that we can clean up this world because people are going to sin whatever we do, even if we stop them from drinking or adultery or homosexuality or abortions or whatever it is, they're still sinners. They're still bound for the lake of fire. The only thing that changes them is the blood of Christ, trusting in that. Then they have the indwelling Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit could change them from the inside out and then the natural result will be a change in the behavior. And so the war there, uh, the reason he says we shouldn't entangle ourselves with the affairs of this life is what I wrote on your outline, is that we are in a spiritual war. It's not a war of the flesh. It's a war of the mind and of the spirit. Uh, look back in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 but thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So recognize that all people are either in Adam or they're in Christ. 
and then fight that fight of faith. Get them to have faith in the blood of Christ so that they may be in Christ. And those who are already in Christ, fight the fight of faith so that they will learn sound doctrine rather than believing false doctrine. Uh, look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So we're not going to try to get the flesh to stop sinning. We're not going to say, well, we got to stop people from stealing, killing, committing adultery, bearing false witness. It doesn't say that. It says, we do not war after the flesh. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In other words, Getting to the flesh is just like putting a band-aid on it. You're not really getting to the root of the problem. You're just covering up what's going on in the flesh. So you say, well, you know, America is now a more moral society because they're not drinking anymore. They're not doing the abortions anymore. Well, they're still sinners. They're still bound for the lake of fire if they haven't trusted in the blood of Christ for as atonement for their sins. So... Um, the weapons of our warfare are not about getting rid of carnal lusts and things, but it's mighty. It goes much bigger than that. It goes to the to the heart of the problem. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it's the Lord who changes the heart and makes you who you are in Christ. He cleanses you. He makes you holy and beloved uh, in Christ. And so... The weapons of our warfare don't deal with the carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now in verse 5, we're going to see where the battle is, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you see there that the things that we are warring with have to do with the mind internally. Imaginations, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Every thought... Those are all internal. Because if you get to the root of the problem, which is the heart and your thinking process, the sin nature that's within you, and you trust in the blood of Christ, and you have the Holy Spirit given to you, and now you have the mind of Christ and the new nature to overcome the sin nature, well then, instead of just dealing with the flesh and putting the band-aid on that by us stopping these certain sins that are particularly bad, then you're casting down the imaginations, the high things, the thoughts, and you're taking those captive, and so now you won't have the manifestations of that evil inward heart in the flesh. You notice verse 7. Notice he says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. So in other words, don't look at the outward appearance of America and see the bad morality, you're going to look on the inward man and the, so, the resolution for all the problems, the moral problems that we see in America has to do with a changed heart. It has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, you being hid in Him, your sins being forgiven, and the Holy Spirit guiding you so that you can walk in the Spirit. And then the natural result is, the outward appearance will change. But don't look to change the outward appearance. Okay, so back in 2 Timothy 2 then. So in verse 4, that's the thing that that uh, Paul is telling Timothy. First in verse 3, he tells them, tells them, stand in that doctrine, endure the hardness, endure the persecutions. And the reason you do that is because you're not concerned with the things of this life. When you look at Christianity as a whole, that's what they're concerned about. You know, all oh, those starving kids in Africa, let's feed them. Oh, you know, the immorality that we see here, let's take care of that. You know, let's take care of the poor. Let's do this and that. And he says, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. We're not worried about a band-aid on the flesh. We're trying to cast down imaginations. Every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of Christ. Bring it into captivity every, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Um, and so it's a spiritual war. And then verse 5, he says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Now we just read 1 Corinthians 9, and it talked about the same thing, striving for the masteries. And Paul said there 
that what he did is he kept his body uh, into subjection. In other words, he's not going to satisfy the appetites of the flesh. He's going to allow the doctrine that has built up the inner man to work through. He's going to present his body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Uh, he's going to yield his members over as instruments of righteousness, not as instruments of unrighteousness. And he's going to allow God to work through him. Um, and it mentions there, except he strive lawfully, you do not receive, you are not crowned. And that's the lawfully for us today. Look over in Romans chapter 6. Look in Romans chapter 6. And verse 13. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now he's going to tell you why you do that. Verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You have gone from a different system. You've gone from that law to grace. And under grace, then, now go over to Romans 8. And we're going to see there is a new, there's law under grace, but it's not the Mosaic law or commandments or anything like that. It's the law of the Spirit. Look in verse 1, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Those are the two systems. You're not under the law, the Mosaic law, the law of the conscience, the law of the mind. That's that law of sin and death. But you've been made free from that through the law of the Spirit of life. That's under grace. Verse 3 for what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. So you see the contrast, the two different systems, flesh and spirit. Now notice verse 6. For to be carnally minded, there's your mind again. Where your battle is, it's in the mind. For to be carnally minded, in other words, you're thinking of the Mosaic law. You're thinking the law of the conscience. You're trying to obey that. He says to be carnally minded is death. You're not going to succeed in that. You're not going to serve Christ that way. There's no fruit from that. But to be spiritually minded means law of the spirit of life, under grace, allowing the doctrine to work through you. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. There's life in that. There's fruit in that. So you go back now to 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So what that tells you is that if I'm over here and I'm um, preaching sound doctrine and I'm preaching the gospel and I'm preaching you know what I should be preaching, but I'm doing it, because of the love of Christ constrains me to see people that way and for to do the will of God. If I'm doing it that way, I'm doing it lawfully. I'm going by the law of the Spirit. So then I'm going to receive a reward for that. I'm going to be crowned. But then you've got other people who do it for a different reason. Look over in Philippians 1. For example, when Paul was in prison, he says there were people who were preaching the gospel, but they, weren't, they did not have the right motivation. Look in verse 15, Philippians 1.15. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So you may have another group of people who preach the gospel for today. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is atonement for sins. Maybe they preach sound doctrine. But they do it for different reasons. They want to, they envy and strife of other pre, right dividing preachers, or envy and strife over, or um, I'm sorry, maybe because they want to uh, be teaching something new and get um, you know people to follow them, and they want power through that, power over people. Um, then they are not doing it lawfully, and so then they are not crowned. Just like in um, 1 Corinthians 9, when Paul gives the example of him running, you think of a runner who would run a marathon. 
uh, just because he's the first one to cross the line doesn't mean that he gets the crown or gets the reward. Maybe he, uh, you know, topped on a car and took a car for five miles to get ahead. Then he went back and ran. Uh, you know, he cheated or he cut the course. Maybe he ran, but he just, you know, cut a few corners and made the course a little shorter. He crossed the finish line first, but he doesn't get crowned because he didn't do it lawfully. He broke the rules. And that's the point here is that the rules for us, verse 4, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. If I'm worried about looking good to other people, if I'm prideful, if I want power over them, if I want money, even if I teach sound doctrine, I'm not doing it lawfully. I'm not according to the law of the Spirit. I'm doing it according to the, uh, the law of the flesh, the carnal mind, which is death. And so then you do not receive a reward for that. Uh, so not only does Timothy need to endure hardness as a good soldier so that others may believe the gospel and come into the knowledge of the truth, he also needs to do it with the right attitude so that he may be rewarded for it. Verse 6 now. Verse 6, it says, The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. And that's really an example to show you that he has to strive lawfully. And uh, it's, it's not a coincidence that he uses the fruits. If you go over to Galatians 5, verse 22... Actually, we were reading Romans 8 where it says, don't walk in the flesh, walk after the Spirit. You see that same contrast in Galatians 5. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Uh, verse 18. If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And then look down in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Again, not the law of the flesh, but you're under the law of the Spirit there. So what he's saying then, going back to 2 Timothy 2.6, when he says the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits, what he's saying is that Timothy needs to learn the doctrine, believe it, and then that's how he then, the doctrine works through him, and that's when the fruit of the Spirit comes. And then since he's partaken of that fruit, then he can pass it on to others. So, um, which goes back to what Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.14, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost, which dwelleth in us. So you keep the sound doctrine, allow that to work through you, then you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life rather than walking after the flesh. And when you have the fruit of the Spirit, then you can then... Um, teach others. You know, then that's what the, the analogy there is. If you're the husbandman or the one who is over the crops there, uh, you have to first partake of the fruit to make sure the fruit is good before you can then sell it. And uh, so that's what he's talking about the doctrine here. You learn the doctrine. You, you get sound in the doctrine. You allow the doctrine to work through you. You have the fruit of the Spirit working through you. Then you have the ability to go on and then sell it, if you will, or give it to others. Commit it to faithful men who will teach others also. I so wrote in your outline that the fruits is the fruit of the Spirit. You must be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man before helping others. And that comes from Ephesians 3 and verse 16. Now, uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, he says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Uh, the all things there would be the things of God for this dispensation. That goes back to 1 Corinthians 2, and we've read that earlier. Uh, understanding those things, then, we learn from this verse here, comes only by reading Paul's epistles. Uh, and we see that from, you know, he says there in verse 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. That's why, uh, as right dividers, we, we consider... Paul first. People say, well, you're elevating Paul over Jesus. Well, no, because this is doctrine that the Lord Jesus Christ revealed to Paul. Uh, we even saw that in 2 Timothy 1.10, that this doctrine is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave the doctrine to Paul. So when we follow what Paul says, 
then we are following really what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us today. And the reason we put an emphasis on that over everything else is because, number one, that's what's written to us today. That's the doctrine for us today. But number two, if we are going to understand all things, all things of God, all things that are in the Bible, um, he says we have to consider what Paul says. So, And this is, remember, this isn't just Paul the man speaking. This is the Word of God here. Uh, look over in chapter 3, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And this is Scripture, all the Bible, Paul's epistles included. So when Paul says, consider what I say, it's not just Paul the man speaking, but it's words that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to him to write down. It's the Word of God, um, the inspired Word of God, because it is Scripture. So when we say, consider what I say, really it's consider what the Lord Jesus Christ says to us through the Apostle Paul. And when we consider that first, then the Lord will give us understanding in all the other things, the things of God that He will teach us through the Holy Spirit as we read God's Word according to 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 through 16, and also all things that are in Scripture, all the doctrine there. Uh, so that's why we put the emphasis on Paul's epistles. And I wrote on your outline that deviating from Paul leads to destruction and perdition. You go back to 1 Timothy 6, and you see that in verse 3. When we covered that a few lessons ago, uh, I noted that the words that are mentioned in 1 Timothy 6.3 are the words that were given to Paul, Paul's epistles. It says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. So there's that considering what Paul says, the doctrine that's found in Paul's epistles, if you don't do that, if you teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, then what you end up doing is, verse 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and it results in verse 9, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. So deviating from Paul's epistles, not considering what Paul says, will result in destruction and perdition. You notice verse 10, the rich or the money is related to false doctrine. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So in 2 Timothy 2, verse 7, when he says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things, uh, deviating from Paul, not considering what Paul says and just going back to the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John or trying to follow Hebrews. Um, it's You're going to be drowned in destruction and perdition as far as your sanctification process, your walk. There won't be a reward for you in heaven uh, of a high position in heavenly places because you did not learn the doctrine. You did not consider what Paul said. And then when you read Hebrews or you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you don't have the doctrine that's in Paul's epistles, you're going to interpret it incorrectly. You're going to have that false doctrine. That's why when you present right division and you present the doctrine in Paul's epistles to people in Christianity, uh, most of them think you're crazy. They don't understand it because they haven't considered what Paul said. They're only considering Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and so their reward is drowned in destruction and perdition. It's destroyed. There's an utter loss of that reward. Uh, so it's important that we not only rightly divide, but we filter the rest of Scripture through the doctrine that's found in Paul's epistles. And um, that's for us <coughs> today in order to understand really everything because what we read in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 the last phrase there in 2 Timothy 1.9 says, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. The reason you're not able to understand all of God's Word without Paul's epistles is because God started His plan with the mystery. It was purposed in Christ before the world began. When you look at the Israel's program, and I don't have the references for you, but it'll say that 
Israel's program was purposed in God since the world began. But the mystery is purposed before the world began. That was the plan in first. So you got to understand the first plan in order to understand the second plan. Uh, that's why in Israel's program, even after the cross, they have trouble understanding what's going on. Um, and so that's why it's important then, even more so for us today in the mystery dispensation, to understand the doctrine.